and welcome to Watch It Baptist Church Online. My name's Mike, I'm the pastor at WBC. It's great to be with you again. Welcome back to the Mance Garden. Uh, I, in order to find a lovely backdrop with some colourful flowers, I'm facing slightly more towards the sun than I realise it's going to be. So if I'm squinting a little bit, that's probably why. We're in the second part of our series looking at parables. We're still in Matthew 21, as we were last time. We're going to be reading from Matthew in just a moment, but we're going to pray first. Let's do that now. Lord Jesus, bring us your gift of understanding, of uh, awareness. Provide us with your Holy Spirit that we might listen well, not just to what the words say or to what our hearts tell us, but to what you want us to recognise and understand here and now. Amen. So we're reading from Matthew 21, we're starting at verse 33, and it says this. Listen to another parable, said Jesus. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them more than the first time, and the tenants treated them in the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretched tenants to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvellous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. So in this session, we've got a bit of work to do. It's been very interesting, quite exciting for me. I'm that kind of person to look at some of what people have written about this passage, as well as looking at it for myself and trying to make some sense of it. And the thing that's been exciting is realising that there are so many different ways for us to look at it, different things we might pick up. Now, the reason I'm excited about that rather than worried about it is partly because of what we know parables are for. They are designed as teasers or, or thinking prompts. They're not there to provide cosy, well-rounded illustrations. They are there to make sure that disciples are thinking about what it is that Jesus is wanting to say to them. And so this feels like an excellent opportunity to explore where we might go with that. So we're going to be looking at three different key interpretations of this passage and then thinking about how we might pick different things out from them, depending on which one we might be focusing on. And then ultimately, we'll be asking some questions too. But let's crack on with the first one. So when you think about it, it's not surprising that different people have landed in different places. The first place I want us to turn to, to have an understanding about this, is to Isaiah. Now I'm not going to read a whole chunk of Isaiah, I'm going to read a little bit from Isaiah chapter 5. The, the verses there, 1 to 7 in, in Isaiah 5, are particularly relevant to this parable, uh, at least in one particular way of reading it. And that's because there is a very similar set of phrases that Jesus uses at the beginning of this parable to the phrases that Isaiah uses at the beginning of chapter 5. And it's about building or creating a vineyard with its wine press and its wall or a hedge and a watchtower as well. So we get to verse 7, it says this, The nation of Israel is the vineyard of the Lord of heaven's armies. That's a name for God. The people of Judah are his pleasant garden. He expected a crop of justice, but instead he found oppression. He expected to find righteousness, but instead he heard cries of violence. Now, in this way of reading this parable, we might end up thinking or agreeing with the, uh, the thinkers who come before us to say, right, this is a way of Jesus describing the issues around rebellion, and around violence and by tying uh, his description of the vineyard to that in Isaiah 
is very clearly talking about Israel as a place rather than uh, the idea of God's chosen people. If we follow this line of thought through, we do find that Jesus may be talking about a kind of response to nationalism. Certainly, it's about, uh, if, if we follow this line of thought, it certainly will be about rebellion. Now, rebellion was pretty commonplace uh, in the Roman Empire. Lots of people groups who were under Roman occupation would attempt to rebel against them. You might remember from the Easter story that uh, Barabbas, who's released when Pilate really wants to release Jesus, is recognised as somebody who's murdered but also has led rebellion. This is not that unusual. Within Judea, we do find historically that there's this kind of weird, slightly uneasy, but definitely present alliance between the Sadducees, that's part of the religious leadership, and the local king, the sort of puppet king that the Romans have put in place. And this combination creates a kind of localised leadership that is aware that it's under Roman power, but really doesn't want to be, wants to exercise its own national identity. I think it's significant that at no point that I can remember, at least in the Gospels, does Jesus criticise Roman occupation. He certainly recognises that it's there, and I don't think for a moment he thinks it's um, a first choice way to be, but he doesn't rebel against it and he doesn't criticise it. In fact, when he's executed, one of the things that the Jewish leaders say to Pilate is that this guy is stirring up trouble against the empire, and Pilate doesn't find that to be true. If we, if we read this as a, a comment on rebellion, what we can see is that Jesus is describing a situation where someone is in charge, they ask for someone else to come and represent them, to uh, take tribute, if you like, or, or their share of um, the rewards for, for having control and ownership of that land, and that over and over again, the tenants, the people who are occupying that land, fight back, they rebel, they refuse to conform, they refuse to give uh, what is due. And so eventually, the man who's planted the vineyard comes back and effectively wipes them out and takes control and hands it to someone else. Now, in this way of understanding this parable, we can see a parallel with what happens to Judea in the future. So you might see it as Jesus saying, if you keep rebelling, eventually the owner's going to come back and throw you off the land. And eventually in AD 70 in Judea, that's exactly what happens. Rome gets so fed up with the endless rebellion and guerrilla warfare and other bits and pieces, political struggle in holding Judea, that Roman forces come to Jerusalem and flatten it. It's a key moment in AD 70 where that happens. And actually some of our understanding of when we date texts in the New Testament come from, whether or not they refer to that or seem to allude to it, because it was such a seismic moment uh, in the story of the early church. So that's our first sort of way of understanding it. Here is a parable that Jesus is telling, where he's saying rebellion, and particularly violence, is not the answer. And if you keep going down that road, eventually what you're going to find is that you get thrown off the land anyway. So it's a comment on rebellion and on violence, and we see some of that from the way in which he's picked up Isaiah 5 and the comments that it makes about violence. So that's the first one. The second one is a little different. The second one takes its uh, lead from the literary context. So rather than focusing particularly on the Isaiah 5 stuff, it recognises that that parallel is there, but it uses the parallel differently. So in this understanding, we lean heavily on the verses that have come just beforehand. So you might remember from last time, Matthew 21, 31 and 32, say this, this is Jesus talking, I tell you the truth, corrupt tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you do. For John the Baptist came and showed you the right way to live, but you didn't believe him. Well, tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even when you saw this happening, you refused to believe him and repent of your sins. So that really is about ownership. It's a sense of whose kingdom this is. And in the previous parable, part of what Jesus is saying is to the religious leaders is it's not yours. It could be yours, but it isn't yours if you're going to keep behaving like this. The key thing is to repent. And if you repent, uh, as the tax collectors and prostitutes did, then ownership is something God shares with you. 
because you've repented, because you've chosen to live his way rather than live differently. And we can see this parable as a continuation of that idea. So in this reading, what we do is we, we recognise that each of the um, each of the landowners' representatives who he sends, up to and including his son, are the, uh, the prophets and then Jesus as representatives of the Father. And so as this process goes on, we see a, a theme that's come up before in Scripture where we see God unhappy with his people for turning his messengers away or killing them. And that he's going on to repeat the point that if you keep rejecting the way the Father wants to do this, then the kingdom won't be yours. It'll be those, it belong to God and those who are obedient to him. So that's the second reading. The third reading, can you believe there are three? There are. The third reading really takes its lead from Jesus quoting uh, in uh, verse 42. He says, have you never read in the scriptures, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvellous in our eyes. So in this instance, uh, the understanding is that Jesus is drawing heavily on Daniel, particularly on something that happens in Daniel chapter 2. So I'm going to read just verse 34 from there. A stone is cut, but not by human hands. It strikes a statue on the feet, and the whole thing comes tumbling down. Now we need to understand the context of that. In this story, in Daniel 2, Daniel has gone to explain a dream to the king that he serves under Nebuchadnezzar. And the dream, which Nebuchadnezzar refuses to tell anybody what it is, and so Daniel has to ask God to, to explain it and describe it to him. In that instance, Daniel talks about the dream having this big statue in it, and the statue is gold at the top, and then silver, and then bronze below, and eventually down at the bottom at the feet. It's a combination of iron and clay. Now, this is not a stable mix, uh, and it's very fragile. It ties in with an understanding uh, that the Jews had that um, in contrast to our culture, where we tend to think things are getting better and better and better, they believe things are getting worse and worse and worse. And so this statue represents a succession of empires and how in the end this rock, this stone that's um, come out of a, kind of a not man-made situation will strike the feet break the feet and then the whole statue will crumble and actually in the description in Daniel it doesn't just crumble it ends up as dust that gets blown away there's nothing left of it now the Jews are pretty confident they knew who these separate sections of the statue referred to so they believed it was the um, Babylonians and the Persians and the Greeks whose empire succeeded each other and then Rome but in this understanding of the parable what we, what we can see, what we might recognise, is that actually the feet of clay and iron are a mixture of the Jewish leadership. So the puppet king and the religious leadership. And it's that combination that is broken by the stone and then the whole statue comes crumbling down. In that instance, the stone is Jesus. And we might recognise or we might understand that this stone is cut but not by human hands so it's not a human being this is the son of god fully human indeed but there's a representation of of where jesus has been sent from in that description and so jesus is going to destroy everything that's come before it and uh, and will bring in the kingdom himself now this is a direct challenge if you like to those religious leaders and that puppet king to say you are trying to bring in the kingdom but actually the kingdom doesn't come because you bring it it comes because god brings it and he might have gone to say and god has sent me to be the bringer of that kingdom elsewhere jesus says uh, the kingdom is coming and has now come and, and invites us to recognize that the kingdom of uh, kingdom of god as led by jesus has already started but it's not fully complete yet. So it's a now and a not yet kind of scenario. I may have mentioned this before. The thing that's challenging there is the idea of who gets to bring the kingdom into being. The implication from the parable being that the tenant farmers believed that it was their job to bring about the kingdom. And the things that they were doing, you know, throwing out, throwing out the, all the 
people who were coming as representatives of the landowner. That was all designed to bring about the kingdom of God. But actually, Jesus is saying, it's not you that does that. It's me that does that. And actually, it can be done in a fairly dramatic way, in a way that really does cut to the heart of what's been there before and, and is upheaval. But it's still God that brings it about. So we've looked at three ways of understanding or interpreting what that parable might be saying. Given the uh, people whose writing I've looked at and, and how I've come to understand those readings, uh, there aren't any, none of those people who talked about them are people who I think, well, they clearly don't know what they're talking about. In fact, in each case, I'd be inclined to trust the, the writer who's brought that um, perspective to my attention. So I'm not inclined to say, well, I need to choose one that's right and throw out the others. I'm not sure that's going to be a helpful thing. And I'm absolutely not convinced that it's necessary. Instead, what I want to recognise is that if the point of parables is that Jesus encourages people to think, then they may well have thought all those things at that time. And it's so it might be that all those things are worth thinking about and worth considering. Now, it may well be that Jesus had one purpose in mind, but we also know enough about Jesus to know that he was very keen on giving people the edge of something so that they landed on it and then got thinking about it. And I think that the more people think about what the kingdom is like and how it comes to be, the better, really, certainly from Jesus' point of view. So then the question becomes, what does Jesus want his audience to be thinking about? And the first thing that we need to do is recognise what he would want his audience at the time to think about or to notice. And so here are some of my suggestions. There are only four of them and they're not definitive. I can't be promising you that they're right, but they're things to keep that thought process going. So here's one. He might have wanted his audience to be thinking about their relationship with secular authority. What was the relationship of the audience with Rome? With these people who absolutely had control of the land, even if they handed over some autonomy to local leadership. What was people's relationship with Rome like? I remember that earlier in Matthew, um, Jesus has talked about how people might respond to being asked to carry a Roman soldier's equipment for a mile. And he talks about doing an extra mile. We can go into why he said that and what he was getting at another time. But he does encourage people to think about how they interact with the Roman presence. It might also be that Jesus wants his audience to think about their perspective on rebellion and violence. It may well have been that wired into a lot of Jewish thinking was we have an obligation to push back. We have a right, uh, we have a, uh, have a duty to be opposing this Roman occupation. And I just wonder whether maybe part of what Jesus was doing was saying, think about what your perspective is on rebellion and then think about how much of that perspective then flows on to become violence as well. We know that this is something Jesus would have been familiar with because one of his disciples was Simon the Zealot, and the Zealots were basically a terrorist group, absolutely focused on overthrowing Roman rule. So he would have been aware of Zealots, I'm sure, before he called his disciples, but he probably would have spent quite a bit of time talking with this Simon about his perspective. And it may well have been something that he wanted his audience to think about with this parable. Third question, third wondering that I have, does Jesus want his audience to be thinking about their assumptions about what it means to have God's approval? He seems possibly to be painting those tenant farmers in that vineyard as those who believe that they are representatives of the Jewish nation or of the kingdom or, or of God's people or whatever, however I would put it. And yet he seems to want to pick at something and say there's something not right here. So I wonder whether he's asking his audience to think, what does it mean to you to have God's approval? What do you think God approves of? And then fourthly, just in my wanderings, I wonder whether Jesus wants his audience to think about their perspective on who Jesus is because it's not that many verses since they were talking about where Jesus gets his authority from. So there's all kinds of things going on there that are possible. And I want to see if we can round this off just by talking a little bit about possible so what applications for us. Because there are these three uh, different ways of reading this parable, different ways of understanding it, it's not going to be so easy to say, well, here's, here's my takeaway, here's my, this is what I must go on from, on, on from here with. Uh, on with from here, one of those. Um, so I want to have a little look at those. I've got five of these. 
and I will just drop them into your thinking brain and we'll see where we go with those. So we might notice Jesus has a strong understanding of what we call the Old Testament. The book of Daniel was relatively new to the Jewish Bible, probably about 150 years before Jesus. And he really knows it well enough to be able to arguably point at that story uh, with the dream and the feet of clay and iron. He knows his Old Testament really well. We might also notice that God doesn't put up with rebellion, but that he is very patient with it. It may have escaped your notice, but actually the, what the landowner does in that story is send someone and then send someone else and then send someone else. And in fact, if we look at Mark's account of the same story, he Mark tells us about this guy going and then this guy and then this guy and then this guy and then more and then more and then some more later and then eventually the son. So there seems to be this idea that, that although the landowner isn't happy, that the father isn't okay with what's happening, he's willing to be patient and to prod and prod to say, let's do this differently. This does bear out the way in which God spoke through his prophets. It's worth noticing this, I think. My third, maybe, so what? Jesus doesn't take issue with Rome, but with religious leaders and with nationalism. So I wonder whether we might take away from this that Jesus is not at all at home with a kind of national identity. You know, because we're Jewish people in the promised land, yeah, we, we have a right to this and this and this and this. I don't think for a moment that Jesus was comfortable with the occupation, but I don't think that necessarily means he was okay with nationalism. And certainly with, with nationalism as a motivation to do things, we think back to the possibility of this story being about rebellion and how that's going to end in tears. I do wonder whether we might consider some of those options. Fourth, God will bring about the kingdom. It's not something people can make happen. I think this is something, whether or not we think this is the best exp expression of what this parable is saying, I still think it's something that's really important. It can be really tempting for us as disciples and as churches to feel that our job is to make the kingdom happen. But the parable suggests that it's not for us to do. And fifth of my possible so what's is Jesus puts his life on the line for his father's will. Certainly it's the case that we're in the last week here before Jesus' arrest and torture and execution. We're, less, we're just a few days, less than a week until the crucifixion with all that it means and all the reasons it matters. And in this moment, Jesus is explaining potentially explaining that he knows that coming on his father's behalf to represent the father's interests is going to lead to his own um, suffering, to his own rejection, uh, and that this seems to be possibly part of how Jesus operates. Certainly, Paul gives us reason to believe in his letters in the New Testament that an acceptance of our weakness um, is a way in which God uses his strength. There will be plenty of other things, and it may well be if you're in a conversation with others, that you come, off, come up with three or four different so what bits of thinking, and even more ways of looking at maybe how the parable might be examined or understood, or how you might um, think it through. I think Jesus would be okay with this. Probably most importantly, I think Jesus would want us to not just go, oh, here's a way of thinking about it, but to go on and allow that to change something of what happens next with all three different interpretations there is a sense of well this could go down this line let's think about what happens if it does and maybe then what might need to change that's it absolutely devoid of any quotes any film references any photographs on the screen or anything like that just because there was enough to be thinking about i'm going to ask three questions in a moment but we're going to pray before we do that lord jesus we thank you for these stories we thank you for the opportunity they provide us with the springboard to think. And we pray that we would use our thinking brains when we read scripture. We allow your words to trigger how we process, how we understand. So maybe you sometimes avoid looking for the right answer and instead to think, how might I consider and examine what God is like through this story? Thank you for all of that. And we pray that we would be transformed by your spirit in line with your will. Amen.
So here are three questions. Number one, in what ways does the local church sometimes try to bring in the kingdom by itself? Question two, how do we respond? And I'm thinking in terms of being you know, as, as disciples or as churches, how do we respond to injustice in ways that are patient and determined? So how is our response to injustice a patient response and how is our response to justice a determined response? We see God responding in those ways. Patient goes again and it goes again, but determined that there will be the right outcome here. Question three, in your experience, how has the church in general, not just watch it back to church or a local church, but in general, how does the church in general think that we need to do things to win God's approval? I'll ask that question again with all that, without that little bits in brackets in the middle. How has the church in general tended to think we need to do to win God's approval? Well, that's it for me. It has been a gloriously sunny opportunity to sit out in the garden uh, in short sleeves. There you go. Uh, and to share some time with you. I do hope that you get some inspiration from this parable. And I do trust that God is working in your heart. God bless. Take care.